friends, we're looking at a series of messages thinking about who our God is as a way to think about him, and that would transform our lives because we know who he is. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. We're going to read uh, 18 verses there, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, page 1606 in the Pew Bible, 1606. Romans 6, 1 through 18. <clears throat> Paul has been talking about grace and about justification, and then we read these words at verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey your heart, you have come to obey from your heart the patterns of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> oh, beloved in Christ, in the very popular 2003 movie, Finding Nemo, yes, almost 20 years, Clownfish Marlin is looking for his lost son, Nemo, finding Nemo. And after a skirmish with a bunch of jellyfish, he and his friend Dory, a Pacific blue tang fish, end up in a school of giant sea turtles who are streaming along in the South Pacific Ocean, specifically in the East Australian Current of the ocean, a current that can move along up to 90 centimeters per second, which sounds fast, but it's really only two miles per hour. But thanks to Pixar's brilliant animators, they make it look like it's zooming along at 90 miles per hour, this school of sea turtles and their friends. So Marlin is found unconscious after his battle with the jellyfish, the jellies, as they are called in the movie. Marlin wakes up rescued, and he is on the back of a giant sea turtle named Crush. And Crush and his cohorts all speak like surfer dudes. Makes sense. They surf the currents underwater, right? And after Marlin wakes up, there's a point in their conversation as they are streaming along that Crush 
cranes back his long turtle neck and tells Marlin, okay, grab shell, dude. In other words, hang on for dear life because the current is about to go roller coaster fast. Well, Marlin grabs hold of Crush's shell and Crush and his cohorts start flying through this current. And besides yelling things like, dude, and totally, and this rocks, Crush also yells, oh, righteous, righteous, yeah! Righteous, righteous. How did the word righteous become a word of excitement, an exclamation for the surfing community to describe monster waves and surfing ability? That is righteous. The world may never know. But we have a God who is righteous. Our God is righteous. And one pastor tells us that righteousness, true God, Birthed God, breathed God, given righteousness is completely misunderstood by our culture today. And that makes sense, doesn't it, as the word has been relegated to the California surfing community. Completely misunderstood by our culture. Of all the things, of all the knowledge that we lack about God and his identity, or that we, in our limited capacity, fail to get to truly understand, even after years of studying God's word, God being righteous and God expecting righteousness from his creation, from us, that just may be the greatest ignorance of all on humanity's part. And so as we take a look at it today, Perhaps we have the greatest opportunity then to learn more today, to fill in gaps in our own understanding, and to be transformed by knowing who our God truly is, by knowing our righteous God. Our God is righteous. It's painted in broad strokes all throughout Scripture. Psalm 145, verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. Psalm 11, verse 7 says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, the upright will see his face. Psalm 119, verse 137 says, You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you've laid down are righteous, they are fully trustworthy. Psalm 111, verse 3 says, Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. Ezra 9, verse 15 says, Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. Nehemiah 9, verses 7 and 9 say, You are the Lord God. You have kept your promises because you are righteous. Job 37, verse 23 says, The Almighty is is beyond our reach and exalted in power in his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Psalm 7 verse 17 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. You can go on and on. It's painted in broad strokes all over Scripture. You can't miss it. You can go on and on, and in Scripture, read in God's Word, He is righteous. He is filled to the brim with righteousness. Our God is righteous. But what does that mean? <clears throat> what does that mean? He always does right. He never does wrong. There is no sin or evil in God. Righteousness is intrinsically in God. It defines him, and God defines righteousness. And his righteousness endures forever. Maybe you heard that verse. He's not unrighteous once in a long while. Oops, ah, messed up there, had a bad day. No. His righteousness is forever. 
Every decision is good and right that he makes. His will is perfectly right. His plan is perfectly right. His judgment is perfectly right. His timing is perfectly right, even though we may think his timing is too slow or too fast sometimes. It's always right. His laws that he gave us, perfect law, no discrimination in it, no affirmative action needed. His law is right for every single person, no matter what. God is righteous to the core, as we might say, inherently righteous, inherently fair. In his nature, <clears throat> in his actions toward us, in his laws, in his history, God has proven himself to be a righteous God. The word righteous comes from the Hebrew word tzaddik, tzaddik. And in Greek, it's dikaios, a word that has the backing of just and justice. Innocence, in the right, devout and upright, always honesty, justice, justness, accuracy, correctness, the right thing, equity, Rightness, all synonyms or descriptors of sorts. One commentator describes God being righteous with four sentences. God is just in all he does. God is upright in all his ways. God operates with honesty always. God always does the right thing that is appropriate for the exact moment. And it's because righteousness is not only something God does, it's something God is. It's part of his character, an attribute of his. There is no other way for him to act because he always remains true to who he is. Every action God takes towards you and me will always be right, just, fair, and honest. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. Psalm 9, verse 8, among other places. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 89, verse 14. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all people see his glory. Psalm 97, verse 6. Righteousness are his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Isaiah 11, verse 5. That same commentator says it how, how we might say it. Righteousness just oozes out of every part of God's character because it is who he is. Now, sometimes people miss God's righteousness, of course. Especially when we think about his being righteous and how it relates to the justice that is part of it. Because we are God's creation and we are made in his image, we ourselves have an innate sense of fairness, don't we? Any parent knows this? Put your young child with another young child, won't take them long, with them playing together, that one of them exclaims, that's not fair. That's not right. How come she gets that toy and I don't? How come he didn't take turns? How come? How come? How come? Righteousness, fairness, justice, rightness are built into who we are too. We have an acute sense of fair play. And when someone tramples on it, the person who feels they've been wronged lets us know it. But often, human beings aim that complaint against God. Assuming that God, like us, messes up his own righteousness and fairness and justice once in a while. God, that's not fair. God, what's happening to me is not right. Why are you treating me unjustly, unfairly, unrighteously. Or when we see in our world something that we really think calls for justice, punishment to be meted out immediately, 
And when it is, we thank God for that. He's just and righteous and fair. But when it isn't, come on. Can't you see what needs to be done here, God? Show your righteousness. Make this right. Meet out your justice. I thought you were a righteous God. And why aren't you just sweeping all these unrighteous people away? They've obviously got it all wrong and are making a mess of everyone's lives. What happened to you being a righteous God, God? Come on, God. They miss his righteousness. Don't see it. And we need to be reminded again that not only is justice part of God's righteousness, so are patience and mercy. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Patience and mercy are part and parcel of God's righteousness. He often offers mercy first. He allows room for repentance so he can bring his mercy. And we have to remember again that God will always do the right thing in every situation. His timing is always perfect. Always right. So here we are knowing we have a righteous God who expects righteousness from his people, expects perfect righteousness from the people he has created, and sometimes when we're feeling really kind of good about ourselves, you can insert the word pride there, when we're filled with pride, or when we're being proud, as we think about measuring up to the standard of righteousness that God has set for us, we'll have a tendency, won't we, to compare our righteousness to those around us. Right? God, look at all these people causing all kinds of disunity and unrest and violence and all kinds of people thinking the wrong way about human sexuality and gender and race and abortion. And, oh, it's so obvious that I'm right and they're wrong. I think the right way, I'm righteous, not to mention dictators who invade countries and drug dealers and people who sucker punch unsuspecting commuters on train platforms and people who blatantly steal from stores and don't care. And the list, my list, your list can go on and on can't it? Compared to them, aren't you glad, God, that you have me championing your righteousness, even if it's only in small ways? I'm still getting it done, aren't I? We compare our righteousness to others all the time so that we come out smelling like a rose. And we forget the comparison we're making is aimed in the wrong direction. It's aimed at those around us instead of aimed at the one who is above us. The Lord God Almighty and righteous. The one that, listen, we were reminded of this a few weeks back during Mission, Mission Outreach Week by the pastor. The one that even angels, even angels because of his Total righteousness, even angels shield their eyes from looking on him, from seeing his righteous face. The seraphim who are at his throne every moment, continually worshiping the Lord God at his heavenly throne, these seraphim must cover their faces. They themselves have never sinned nor done wrong. Think of it. They must protect their own eyes from a direct apprehension of the Lord's transcendent righteousness or they will be blinded by it. Above the Lord were seraphim and with one of their three pair of wings they covered their faces. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 2 and 3. For a split second, try comparing your righteousness to his. Do you dare? In the presence of the righteous God, do you dare? 
or to use the sermon title, Our God is Righteous. Are you? And you'll never guess what the answer is. This morning we talked about the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, the flesh, our sinful nature, never stop attacking us. And he's asking us, are you righteous? I hope you know the answer. It's this. This is the answer. That for those who have faith in Jesus, God's righteous son, the righteous one, the one who is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, as Hebrews tells us. So Jesus, God's own son, we know he is perfectly righteous himself and in himself, second person of the Trinity. Of course, he is righteous. He is just like his father. He is righteous. For those who have faith in Jesus, God's own son, God tells us, you are righteous. We've been declared righteous by God. That's written all over Romans 6. Here's a paraphrase. Verse 2, we are those who have died to sin. Verse 3, we were baptized in Christ Jesus' death. Verse 4, we were buried with him in order that we too may lead a new life, a righteous one, just like Jesus Verse 5, we've been united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 6, our old self, unrighteous, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Verse 7, anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, we died with Christ, we live with him. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ, of course. Verse 12, do not let sin reign. Verse 13, don't offer any part of yourself to sin. Offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. Verse 14, sin shall no longer be your master. Verse 16, you are slaves to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Verse 17, you used to be slaves to sin. Now you have a new allegiance, a new pattern of teaching. Verse 18, you've been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. What are all those verses saying? Those who have faith in Jesus are righteous. They are declared righteous by God. God looks at them and sees righteousness. Sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Perfect righteousness. The righteous one, carrying in him perfect, divine, never-failing righteousness. God the Father sees that in those who have faith in Jesus. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? God takes his righteousness and puts it on us. Takes Jesus' righteousness, puts it on us. As the Apostle Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, the only human being ever to have no sin, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He did that on the cross. God placed the sin, the unrighteousness of the entire world upon his own son, and once placed there, God punished his own son because of our unrighteousness and sin. God punished him with an eternal, perfectly just, perfectly righteous punishment. Jesus took that for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God imparted his own righteousness onto those who trust in Jesus. You stand before God, you sit here before God right now, and you stand before God 10 minutes from now, in the middle of the night, Tomorrow at work, you stand before God, and God has declared, is declaring, and will declare you righteous. Remember, the righteousness of God is forever. He gave it to you, and once given, he does not take it away. Now, before we get any cockamamie ideas, any proud ideas, it had nothing to do with us. With how much more righteously you live your life than the mean neighbor down the street 
No, had nothing to do with us, had everything to do with Jesus and what he did on that cross. A gift of grace to you and me. Even the faith to believe it of all things, a gift to you and me. Think of it, the one who is so perfectly righteous before whom sinless angels cover their eyes at this very moment. He is looking at you and declaring you just and innocent and in right standing with him. Perfectly righteous, all because of what his son Jesus, what he did for you. Ruth Van Dyke, early Friday morning, could approach her righteous God, our righteous God, knowing that God had declared her righteous in Christ Jesus. Amen? So, are you righteous? You trust in Jesus and what he did. Yes, you are are. Our God is righteous. Are you? Yes, you are. So simple. Here's how Bible teacher and author Clarence Haynes simply puts it. If you are in Christ, the good news is your account has already been settled because Jesus has made atonement for you. You have been declared righteous. If you are not in Christ, then you will be judged according to God's standard of righteousness, which no one can meet in their own ability. This means you have two choices. You can stand in your own righteousness, and he puts in parentheses, not a good idea, or you can stand in Christ's righteousness, definitely the better of the two options. Either way, God will apply his just standard, and every judgment will be just and right, because that is who he is. In other words, beloved, there is a day coming when we die or when Jesus comes again, when God in his righteousness will set everything straight. There is a day coming, a moment coming, when we all must appear before the judgment seat of God, before the righteous judge, and God will settle all accounts righteously. Do you trust in a God who is righteous, who declares you righteous because his son brings that same righteousness to you? If your answer is no, there's still time. We have no idea how much, but there's still time to put your trust in Jesus. And if your answer is already yes, wonderful, you are righteous, declared righteous. And as a former Bible professor of mine used to say all the time, it's time to become what you are in thankfulness for what Jesus did. Become what you are. You're righteous. Now live righteously. Ho, ho, righteous, righteous, yeah. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. We couldn't have done it. Not in a heartbeat could we have done it. Not in a single moment could we have done it. But you, through Jesus, declared us righteous. How incredible is that? We love you for that. And we pray that we would truly become what we are. You've said that when you look at us, you look at Jesus, his righteousness. Lord, we want to become what we are, what you have declared us to be. Give us strength. Give us help in doing that every single day. Every day we wake up, we pray that we would be people who come before your throne and ask you to help us to live the righteous way that your son lived. Because when you see us, you see him. So we got to become what we are. Help us to do it, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, through your word, which is filled with your righteousness, but also tells us how to live righteous lives. Thank you for your word and spirit. Thank you for declaring us righteous. Thank you for, well, everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.